This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ as vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman popes rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with 50 million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today They offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome to a new video from Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth. This is another reading, and if I am not mistaken, I just have to take a little look here. <laughs> it's number 31 of the book History of the Inquisition by Philip from Limborch, and we continue on the Albigenses and Waldenses, which I started last time. And it's uh, very interesting, and I read a, a little bit on beforehand, as you will see, because here and there I marked a little bit, but that already is more than a week ago, so I don't even remember that much anymore. But I know that in the reading before this, I made quite a little mistake about accusing the Albigenses of something that they weren't. But that was because I understood the book wrong, and I will set that record straight. In this, the 31st reading of the History of the Inquisition by Philip from Limbosch, this wonderful book, where we learn so much about um, the Inquisition, the whole history of it, from the days of the Apostles on uh, until the Middle Ages, until about the 1700s when this book was written. So I'm very much looking forward to continue reading this book and... Um, Thereby I say, okay, let's go. <clears throat> I went to page 50, and um, that's where I'm going to pick up. That is uh, page 218 in the PDF, if you read along. And you know that I take this old PDF, because uh, the other link that I got sent, yeah, I see that tens of... 10th of August was my last reading, and today we have the 27th, so that's three weeks almost later. Um... You know, this this other link uh, was really an abridged version there. This um, chapter that we are reading right now has four pages, and here we have a lot more. So that's why I'm going to continue in this old, even though very difficult to read, um, copy of the history of the Inquisition. 
But okay, without any further ado, let's continue reading here on page uh, 51. From these instances, and I'm going to pick it right up where we left on last, where we left off last year. Yeah, you know we had this uh, William Giuliani. Uh, you see here this uh, public and sworn notary of the office of the Inquisition. We read his accusation, uh, uh, accusations, and um, now we're going to pick up right here after that on the bottom of page 51. From these instances, the author continues here, it appears that the opinions of the Albigenses and Waldenses were different. However, it is not to be doubted, but that oftentimes their enemies gave very vile and audacious accounts of the doctrines they held, as will appear by comparing the several places in which they described them. For the same opinion, which in one place appears extremely erroneous, and another, when it is more fully explained and without spite, it harmless enough, is harmless enough, of which the single instance of the resurrection of the dead is full proof. For sometimes the Albigenses are accused that they deny the resurrection of human bodies, as though they quite denied the resurrection of the dead which yet in another place is more distinctly explained thus, that the dead shall arise with spiritual bodies, and that their opinions have been misrepresented elsewhere, there can be no doubt, and it will, be appear, uh, and it will appear upon a comparison of the several places wherein they are recorded. But that the opinions of the Albigenses and Waldenses were very different cannot be denied, for if they had held the same no reason can be assigned why different ones should be ascribed to them. One would rather be inclined to believe that as their persecutors greedily fought after, sought after every occasion to punish them, they would have fastened on every one of them all the heretical opinions of the Valdenses and Albigenses. That so being burdened with the numerous crimes the Inquisitors might seem to have the more just pretense for condemning them. So as you can see, this word for is highlighted because here I wrote a little comment and I'm going to read that comment to you right now. It's something that I prepared because of my misunderstanding of what we read in the last part of this chapter. So I want to set the record straight. So now take my comments from the last video about what the Albigenses believed what I said, not what the author said, but what I said, and put it into the trash can of false information. The way I understood the author at the time I read, it was doing injustice to these fine folks who upheld the Bible through the ages. The author writes very confusingly at times, and that leads me to spontaneous wrong comments when he corrects what he says a few pages later. Let's keep it this way. The reason the Roman Catholic Church persecuted and eventually destroyed the Albigenses as well as the Valdenses was because they adhered to the word of God and the Roman Catholic Church that only claims to do the same, only claims to do the same, uses all means of lies and deceit to accuse those folks of just the opposite. The way that I understood when reading first it was like that was the confession of faith of the Albigenses themselves. As it now turns out to be, I was misunderstanding and therefore I admit my error in condemning the Albigenses for biblical heresy. So, this is a correction of what I said in the previous reading. And I want you to take that to heart and see and acknowledge that I repent of any false comment that I made there. But as I said, the writer sometimes writes very confusingly and uh, because I just don't have the time to read this book once or twice in advance before going to YouTube and read it on a camera, and read it audio recorded as this one, I have to live with these mistakes that can happen and I hope that you will forgive me. But eventually I think we all learn a lot from the reading of this book. Now the author continues on the middle of page uh, 51, For this very cause it may be justly concluded that many other of those impious tenets 
that are ascribed by Baronius, Bzovius and others to the Albigenses and Waldenses were invented out of mere hatred to them. Hello, that's what I just mean. Here he comes and says this, that these accusations were mere invention out of hatred to the Albigenses and Waldenses. And that is something that I, of course, did not work into my reading the previous one. Okay? And to render them detestable to the people. Especially that impious opinion which uh, uh, Americus, direct in Inquisitions, paragraph 2, uh, quasi 14, imputes to the Waldenses. Quote, that tis better to satisfy a man's lust by any act of uncleanness whatsoever than to be perpetually burning, and that, as they say and practice, tis lawful in the dark for men and women to lie promiscuely with one another, whensoever and as often as they have the inclination and desire. Unquote. For if this had been their tenet, the Albigenses, would there not have been one that that vast number of prisoners that they condemned so much various punishments to be found that was infected with it? Or, if it, if it could, been, could have been proved upon them, was the equity, humanity and compassion of the inquisitors so very great as to have concealed a crime that would have been condemned by the common voice of mankind and exposed those that were guilty of it so, um, to the most severe punishment and death? Would they, by such a method of acting, have given the world occasion to censure them for persecuting and cruelly punishing men merely for the sake of holding opinions different from the Roman faith? Though consistent with a due regard to a good conscience, when at the same time they might have accused them of, horrid and, uh, of so horrid an impiety? If they had been really such execrable persons, the Albigenses, their crimes ought to have been publicly exposed, and thus they themselves would have sunk under the weight of infamy, and their prosecutors would have been so far from being charged as bloody inquisitors that they would have deserved the universal applause. I think that is a very important point the author makes here. That's why I'm going to read this last sentence again. I'm going to highlight it for you that you can easier read it with me. Let's read this little sentence again. If they, the Albigenses, had been really such execrable persons as we have read in the acquisition here of James Mascetius, the notary of the Inquisition in the first, in the last reading, in the uh, in the beginning of this chapter, and other things, if the Albigenses had been really such execrable persons, their crimes ought to have been publicly exposed. You know, this is the same. Let's let's go to let's go to Waco. 1993 in the United States of America. Or let's go to what Tom Fress is very often talking about, which I don't have that uh, background information that he has, of course, but it's the same. Uh, it, it's it's the same thing. It's uh, Tony Alamo Ministries. Now, when we just go back to Waco, if the people in Waco were really a horrible, execrable cult sect, as the American government put it at that time. Why weren't they exposed for what they did, but only false accusations were claimed at Waco in 1993 and the same with Tony Alamo Ministries in 2009 and 2008? The problem is that these people, neither Tony Alamo nor David Koresh or his quote-unquote sect from Waco were an execrable race but they were just working against the Antichrist of the Bible the Pope they were exposing the Pope in all ways they could do now I don't talk good of the 
of the way that in Waco there was made money with dealing weapons and all that stuff. I don't care for that and I do not support I do not support that, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to the bottom line, Waco was an act of inquisition and what they did to Tony Alamo also was an act of inquisition. And reading this book maybe helps us see that what we didn't see before in that case. So that's why when we read here their crimes ought to have been publicly exposed. Well, no crime whatsoever that so-called was committed in Waco in the 1990s nor any crime that has been so-called been committed by Tony Alamo in the early 2000s has been publicly exposed. The only thing they exposed were allegations that even the jury came back and said we cannot convince this guy, what shall we do? And when you want to know the whole story, well then go to uh, First Amendment Radio's archives of 2009 and there you can uh, hear what Tom Fress has to say about that on Inquisition Update. I'm not uh, repeating all that stuff here, but you can look that up for yourself. Just uh, spend a little money to support First Amendment Radio and uh, you have access, full access to the archives and you can listen to that for yourself. It's about the time from September to December in 2009 in these broadcasts uh, he often refers to Tony Alamo Ministries and what happened there. And it was known at that time, or not at that time, but it was known later, that these uh, so-called witnesses, these, I think, four children they were, uh, that were brought forth by the FBI as witnesses of the, um, of the prosecution, uh, confirming quote-unquote confirming that Tony Alamo had uh, pedophile actions in his, uh, in his ministry and all that stuff, that these confessions were confessions made under oppression of the FBI. The children have been told that if they don't say that, their parents would be killed. No? So there has never been anything exposed in Tony Alamo Ministries that was not biblical. <laughs> and there was never anything exposed in the same kind in Waco in 1993. And this is why I think the author makes here a very important point when he says, if the Albigenses had been really such execrable persons, their crimes ought to have been publicly exposed. But the problem is you cannot publicly expose something that did not take place. Neither with the Albigenses or the Valdenses in the Middle Ages, as we read here, nor at Waco or at Tony Alamo Ministries. You can only, quote-unquote, publish accusations but you can never publicly expose their crimes because their crimes are inventions of the persecutors. And when you understand that the persecutor here with the Albigenses and Valdenses is the same as the persecutor with, well, uh, with Waco and Tony Alamo Ministries, then you get the picture. Now, the sentence continues. And thus they themselves would have sunk, they themselves, the Albigenses, would have sunk under the weight of infamy. And their prosecutors would have been so far from being charged as bloody inquisitors as they would have deserved the universal applause. Yeah. They would not have been needed to be persecuted by the inquisitors. Every normal quote-unquote layman on the street would have persecuted them if their crimes would have been publicly exposed. But there could not, could not have been a public exposure of what just didn't happen. You get it? And this is <clears throat> this is kind of a a line we see throughout history. It is always about accusations. It is never about real crimes that happened publicly exposed. Uh, today they do that with 
kind of a false flag operations you know we need to blame islam on something oh, okay we're gonna bring down world trade center and we're gonna tell the people that islam did it that's what they do today the prosecutors are quote unquote publicly exposing the crimes of the people they make their enemy the problem is that you have to look and check if this explosion of crime is actually of has actually happened the way that they tell you because everybody today knows who has two working brain cells that 9-11 was a quote-unquote inside job it could never have been done without the knowledge and cooperation of the United States government it's impossible and the media and everything else and they all work together and that's no conspiracy theory <clears throat> that is when you learn your Bible and when you learn books like this that you get a look behind the veil and that you will see that so I'm very sorry that I take so much time in explaining uh, explaining this stuff but uh, I've I, I, I really need to th I, I really think that I need to make this point you know this is not just the book reading of the history of the Inquisition I think this is also trying to lay connections to the times that we are living in right now and that we can see that what they have done in the Middle Ages and before they are doing today they only give it another name oh it's another color it's another mask they put on but the visage after uh, behind that mask is still the same it is still the visage or visage of the devil who is transferred into an angel of light and selling you bad for good and good for bad he did that throughout all ages and he is still doing this today and he has been exposed in the past he is being exposed today and he will be exposed in the future and there are people who study it for themselves get it and do something about it for themselves and for others and there are people who just don't get it what kind of person are you do you get it do you see how the devil has closed himself as an angel of light and his ministers into ministers of righteousness and by that could not publicly expose the crimes of the Albigenses here in the past but made it appear to the people that they were that way exactly like today do you get it let me know write a comment hence we may learn the author continues what credit is to be given to popish writers when they give us an account of the opinions and practices of those they call heretics Tis their way to charge all that separate from their communion with impurity and lust, as though the only cause of their leaving the communion of the Church of Rome with a dishonorable and vile love of woman, and they have most impudently dared to reproach with this vice persons that have been remarkable for their chastity and continence. In the meanwhile, nothing is more notorious than that their monks and priests who are forbid the remedy of a chaste and honorable matrimony abandon themselves without shame to the most impure embraces and infamously wallow in carnal pleasures this is such an important sentence you cannot read it often enough and when we speak here about this so-called chastity a vow that is so easily broken we have to understand 
that the priests and the monks they are having more sex than the average person has and whether with each other because they are sodomites or the monks or the priests with nuns and of course via the confession box and therefore I would really advise you to read the book from Charles Chiniqui The Priest, The Woman and the Confession um, I think it is called and um, that's a wonderful book also Tom Fress read in 2009 on First Amendment Radio and uh, the only shame that I think in that book is that uh, there are a lot of uh, really degenerating questions the priest asks the woman in the confessional and these questions are put in there in the book only in Latin and when you even try to translate that in uh, on a modern computer like I have uh, <laughs> my computer is not that modern but it's <laughs> it's it's uh, 10 years old or something but still quite modern uh, when you try to to, uh, to translate these uh, these sentences don't really make sense so you need a better translation than the online translation program for that but that's on the end of the book the priest the woman and the confessional by charles chiniqui and i could really uh, advise you to read that and then you read about this carnal pleasures because that's what the priests and what the monks are actually all about yeah they are forbid the remedy of a chaste and honorable matrimony that is quite true but why should matrimony be chaste? I mean, maybe I have the wrong understanding of the word chaste, but matrimony, when a man and a woman live together, should not be chaste. They are allowed to do everything with mutual agreement. God is no spectator in the bedroom. The Roman Catholic Church is. That's something else. Anyway, not going into too little detail here, but... I'm going to read the sentence again because I think it is quite important that we understand that in the meanwhile nothing is more notorious than that their monks, the Roman Catholic churches, their monks and their priests who are forbid means who are forbidden the remedy of a chaste and honorable matrimony abandon themselves without shame to the most impure embraces and infamously wallow in carnal pleasures. Erasinus Tom 9, page 401, says, quote, There is a certain German bishop who declared publicly at a feast that in one year he had brought to him 11,000 priests that openly kept horse. Okay? There is a certain German bishop who declared publicly at a feast that in one year he had brought to him 11,000 priests that openly kept horse, for they pay annually a certain sum to the bishop. This was one of the hundred grievances that the German nation proposed to the Pope's nuncio at the convention at Nuremberg in the years 1522 and 1523. Grievance number 91 Quote, that the bishops in most places and their officials not only suffer the priests to keep horse, so they pay a certain sum of money, but even force the chaster priest who live without horse to pay the price of those that keep them, alleging that the bishop wants money and that those priests who pay it may either remain single or keep horse as they please. How wicked a thing this is, everyone understands. And the same, the same Erasmus, in his account of the errors of Beda, Tom 9, page 484, has the following passage, quote, what wonder if some nuns in the age of St. August uh, of St. Austin are said to have married, when in this age there are said to be so many monasteries that are nothing better than public stews. Yeah? Means pleasure houses. I don't whore houses, yeah, to say it quite frankly. 
and more that are private ones. You know, the house of the rising sun. It's uh, how you package it, you know. Many monasteries that are nothing better than public whorehouses. And more that are even private ones. Even in those where the ruins are the most strict, where the rules, sorry, where the rules are more strict, there are more that have the veil than their virginity. This I relate with grief, and I wish it was not true. And a little after he continues, I know some that have buried in the monasteries the girls they have abused, that the affair might be hushed up. Unquote. And page 569 in Better he says, Cries, uh, Better means uh, Ibit, I think, so from the same book, says, He cries out gloriously, God forbid, God forbid that any man should be admitted to the dignity of the priesthood, priesthood who doth not wholly deny himself carnal embraces, though that this day there are some to be found to keep. Fifty horse, not to add anything worse. And page 985, concerning the prohibition of the flesh, it says, quote, Amongst the priests, how scarce is the number that live chaste? I speak of those who keep publicly at home their horse instead of wives, for I will not mention the mysteries of their secret lusts. I speak of those things only that are well known, to everyone. Unquote. But the instance he gives on page 1380 is yet more execrable. That a certain Dominican professor of divinity, whose name was John, mentioned to him at Antwerp, in Belgium today, in the house of Nicholas of Middleburg, a physician, a divine of Louvain, the city where I live in, who told him that he refused to give absolution to a certain confessor of the nuns, because he acknowledged he had lain with two hundred of them. But what need is there of producing testimonies out of particular authors? The very laws of the Inquisition which ordain punishments to those priests who solicit not only women, but, which is, uh, what is much worse, even boys in the sacrament of confession are an undeniable proof that these crimes are too frequent and common in that state of impure celibacy. So that having their own minds ensnared with the lusts of the flesh and their eyes as the scripture expresses it full of adultery like the generality of mankind, they judge of others by themselves and insinuate that the only, at least the chief cause of forsaking the Church of Rome is the immoderate love of woman, whereas, it, <coughs> whereas, if, uh, whereas if they were not acted by the principles of a good conscience, but from a desire of gratifying their lustful inclination, they might with much more safety abide in the communion of the Church of Rome, that they were that they have daily occasions offered to them to fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. They have nothing to fear even from the bloody tribunals of the Inquisition, if they are but cautious, though they solicit women in the very sacrament of the confession. This for once to refute the calumnies of the Papists, who, whenever they are giving an account of the rise of any of them those they call heretics, are perpetually repeating this charge against them. But now, to return to our purpose. Besides the above-mentioned differences of doctrines between the Albigenses and Waldenses, they differed also in their rites and customs. For at first there were two sorts of the Albigenses. Some professed their faith and used their customs and were called perfecti, uh, perfecti fur consolidati, means uh, perfect or comforted. Others only entered into a covenant with these perfect ones, which they call la convenenza, the, uh, the agreement that at the end of life they would be received into their sect. 
This reception is often called heretication, and it was performed uh, it was performed after this manner to Benedictus Molinieri in a certain illness that he laboured under. Bernard de Gotch, one of the Albigenses, held the hands of a sick person between his own and held a certain book over him, in which he read the Gospel of St. John. In the beginning was the word, and delivered to him a fine thread, with which, with which he was to be tied for heresy. The rites administered to a sick woman were somewhat different. Petrus Alteri said in the presence of the sick woman, Praise God, either instruct, instructing the woman to say so, or saying so by himself. He then laid his hand upon the woman, holding a certain book, and reading some words, but first put a white linen cloth above her, and after he had read in the book, Peter and Aurelius made many bows near her bed. For this reception they were prepared by certain abstinences, which I gather from the sentence of Peter Raimundus Dominicus de Borno, who is said to have seen Peter Austeri with, with, uh, with Peter Sanxie, who then kept those facts, which they are obliged to do, who are to be admitted to the sect of heretics. This admission was believed to save the soul of the person admitted, and was called spiritual baptism, the consolation, the reception, and good end. That they were believed to be so sanctified by it, as that afterwards it was, as that afterwards it was unlawful for them to be touched by a woman. Thus we read in the sentence of a woman whose father had been received amongst the Albigenses. Quote, that she was forbid by her father to touch him, because after his reception no woman ought to touch him, and from that time she never did touch him. And in another woman's sentence, that was unlawful for her to touch Petrus Sankey, and that she heard that it was reported amongst them that they neither touch a woman nor suffer themselves to be touched by one. But inasmuch as it was possible that the person received might <clears throat> Sorry, but as much as it was possible that the person received might return to his former pollutions, his reception was delayed to his last sickness, when there was no more hopes of recovery. And um, when there was no more hopes of recovery, that so he might not lose the, go the good he had received, for which some reason. Uh, some were not admitted to one of the Albigenses was present, because now it was not believed they would immediately die. Thus this reported of Petrus Sankei, that being called to hereticate a certain sick woman, she was not then hereticated, because she did not think it proper upon account of her not being weak enough. And afterwards, through the distemper, grew more violent. Petrus Sankei did not hereticate her, because she recovered. As for those who were receiving, uh, as for those who were received during their illness, they were commanded to make use of the endura, meaning fasting, and to hasten their death by the opening a vein and bathing. Thus, this reported of a certain woman that she perverted. Uh, that she persevered, sorry, thus this reported of a certain woman that she persevered in the Albigenses, in the abst, what am I reading here? I'm, I'm sorry, this <laughs> thus this reported of a certain woman that she persevered in the abstinence which they call the endura many days and hastened her, dead, her, her bodily death by losing her blood frequent bathing and greedily taking a poisonous draught of the juice of wild cucumbers, mixing with it broken glass, that by tearing of her bowels she might sooner die. Of another it is said that she was forbidden by her mother-in-law to give her little daughter that had been hereticated by Peter Sankei any milk to drink, by which it died. Another confesses that she had not seen her father since his heretication, eating or drinking anything but cold water. 
but one Hugo, who continued several days in the Endura, did afterwards, by his mother's persuasion, eat and recover. The same year Peter Senkiai invited him to enter the Endura and so make a good end, but he would not agree till, uh, to it till he, be, he, till he came to die. The same Hugo saw that Sankius procured and hastened his own death by bleeding, bathing and cold. Petrus Oteriae is said to have received another woman, and after her reception to have forbid that any meat should be given to the said hereticated sick woman. And there were two women who attended her that watched that there should be neither meat nor drink given the whole night nor following day, lest she should, uh, she should lose the good she had received and contradicted the order of Peter Oterii, uh, although he said sick woman desired that they would give her meat. But the third day after, she eat and grew well. And the sentence of Peter Raimundus of the Yugos, we read these things concerning the Endura. You voluntarily shorten your own corporal life and inflict death upon yourself because you put yourself in that abstinence which the heretics call Endura, in which Endura you remained six days without meat or drink, and wouldst not eat, neither yet willed, though oftentimes invited to it. However, all of them did not care to subject themselves to a severe law, to so severe a law. For we read of a certain woman, that she would not suffer her sick daughter, although near death, to be received, because then her said daughter must be put in the Endura. There is also an instance of a woman who, for fear she should be taken up by the inquisitors, put herself in the Endura, and sending for a chirurgeon, means a surgeon probably, ordered him uh, to open one of her veins in a bath. And after the surgeon was gone, she unbound her arm in the bath, so that the blood running out more freely, she might sooner die. After this she bought poison in order to destroy herself. Afterwards she procured a cobbler's owl, which in that barbarous age was, uh, they call Elzina, intending to run it into her side. But the woman disputing amongst themselves whether the heart was on the right side or the left, she at last drank up the poison and died the day after. They had also a peculiar manner of saluting each other, by embracing putting their hands to both sides and putting their head three times to each shoulder, saying every time, Praise the Lord. Which manner of salutation seems to have been very common among them, because we find it mentioned in the sentences of many of them, and was performed sometimes with bended knees, sometimes by putting their heads down, even to the ground. Sometimes also this custom was insisted on. So we read of a certain person being required by the said heretic to bend the knee before him and say, Praise ye the Lord, and bend on his knee and set before him, Praise ye the Lord. The heretic answered, May God bring you to a good end. And a certain woman, that she saw a certain person bowing before Peter Oteriae in her aforesaid house, and then she was required to make her amendment for the sick heretic, as the other did. And then she also began to bend the knee before the said heretic, and knew not how to make the aforesaid amendment, upon which they who were present began to laugh, which made her blush and go away. We read of another that he agreed with Peter Oterii, that he would command himself to him, that he might pray to God for him, and began to bow the knee before him, and that Peter Oterii said, Ye may not do it, for this is not the place and so sent him away, that he might not bow the knee before him, which he was willing, and, ha uh, and had begun to do. Nor was this manner of salutation required only from those who were admitted, but also made use by, of by those who were called perfect, and admitted others as often as they met one another. Thus we read in the sentence of Amelius de Perles, 
that he and Peter Oterius saluted each other with mutual adoration before the inquisitors, and that they both adored each other after an heretical manner before them by falling on their faces on the ground, and said that they were of the same sect, and acknowledged that they had elsewhere oftentimes adored one another after the same manner. They fasted three days a week on bread and water. A certain sick man was old that he must have no food unless he could repeat the Pater Noster. Our father is that. We read of the Valdenses that they had certain elders or majoris of their sect. Thus John of Lorraine was called majoralis of that sect and Christian and John of Chabli majoris. It is reported of them also that they prayed on their knees before and after dinner, leaning on, uh, leaning on a table. This occurs in almost all the sentences of the Valdenses. It was also customary with them to say grace over their meat. Because parent father was accused that, they e that he eat and drink with the Valdenses at the same table that had been blessed by them. They used to compare themselves with the apostolical life and persecution, and boast that they were equal to them in merit, and that they persevered and in imitated the evangelic and apostolic poverty, upon which account they obtained the name of the poor men of Lyon. Besides this, they had other customs different from the common way of living. Thus we read that she said that the said sect of the Valdenses. Yeah, we are reading still about this one sect of the Valdenses, separated and differed in, differed, differed in other things from the common life and manners of the faithful. And lastly, we read in the sentence of John Philibert, a presbyter, that the Valdenses preach to their believers sometimes after supper in the night out of the Gospels and Epistles in the vulgar language. Now, since, therefore, there is so great a diversity in the opinions and customs of the Albigenses and Valdenses, it is very evident that they were two distinct sects, both of them abhorring the communion of the Church of Rome, but in many things differing from each other. This appears most plainly from these acts, or for all those that received sentence to page 92, the Albigenses. Stephen Puncher is the first of the Valdenses mentioned in the same page. Page 96 follows the sentence against John Bryaf, the Valdensian. After that, the Albigenses and Valdenses are condemned promiscuously, but in, a, in such a manner as that at first view one may know one from, an, from the other. The principal persons of the Albigenses, who received others, and are mentioned in the several sentences are Petrus Otiarai, James, his son, and William, Peter's brother, Petrus Raimundi di Sancto Papulo, Americus Barotti, Emilius de Perlis, Andreas de Padres, Octavius, Petrus Sanchiai, de Garda, Bernardus Andoni, uh, Andon, and, Andoni di Monte Acuto, and a great number of others mentioned on pages 93, 101, 106, 123 and 146. From hence I conclude that they were not only two distinct sects originally, but they were not united into one church afterwards, at least in the year 1320, half an age after the first rise. I cannot, however, deny, the author continues, that Evonitus, uh, who lived about those times, attributes many things to the Valdenses, which in these acts are ascribed to the Albigenses, meaning that they are divided into two parties. There are some, says Evonitus, who are accounted perfect. These are probably called the poor men of Lyon. Uh, Lyons, uh, that's the city in the south of France, the poor men of Lyon. All are not taken in under this character, but are first instructed themselves a long while that they may know how to teach others. These perfect declare that they have nothing of their own, neither houses nor possessions, 
nor certain dwellings. And if they had any wives before, they put them away. They say they are the true successors of the apostles, and are the masters and confessors of others. Go visiting about the countries, and confirming their disciples in their error. These disciples bring them all things necessary. Into whatever place they come, they give notice of their arrival. They are met with great, uh, by great numbers in some safe and secret place to see and hear them. They send them the best of meat and drink. They appoint collections for support of their poor, their masters and students who have nothing of their own, or else to inveil others who are drawn over to their party by the love of money. Most of these things are ascribed to these acts, to the Albigenses, so that they sometimes seem to have been confounded with one another. I mean, let me just um, make a little comment here of what I'm reading here. We have a lot of things that the Albigenses and the Waldenses have in common, and we have apparently some things that they differ on. Why is that important? Well, because most and for all, when you go to the south of France and you go to where the border of Spain is, and from there you go to where the border to Italy is, that region in the south of France, where the city of Albi was and where the Waldenses also lived, in this region they lived and they probably interchanged one another. I don't think that there was uh, that there was no connection between those two. They they knew each other and they exchanged each other also probably. And um, sometimes you don't know where the Albigenses end and the Waldenses begin and the other way around, you know. And I think this is why the author gives us the ex this explanation um, that we are reading here in this book, that we can come to the understanding um, that uh, sometimes things are said about the Waldenses and they work the same way for the Albigenses and the other way around. This last sentence uh, does quite make it clear. Huh? Most of these things are ascribed in these acts to the Albigenses, so that they sometimes seem to have been confounded with one another. On the other hand, the author continues, Pegua and Ameri uh, Americus seem to have acknowledged a difference between them. For Pegna, upon Americus' directory of the Inquisitors, on paragraph 2, comment 38, <coughs> sorry, calls the sacrament of the Albigenses, Consolentum, the consolation, and adds that their other sacrament was the blessing of bread. This, says he, is a sort of breaking bread, which they daily use as dinner and supper. It is performed after this manner. When the Puritans, so he calls the Albigenses, are come to the table, they all say the Lord's Prayer. In the meanwhile, he, who is the principal person amongst them, either to the riches or dignity, takes in his hand one or more loaves according to the number of those that are present, and saying, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. He breaks the loaf or leaves and distributes to all that sit down, whether they are Puritans or only their believers. And in this they differ from the men of Lyon, for they perform this ceremony or blessing only once in a year. Now, I have to add here something, because that what this person does here, uh, breaking this bread and say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always, is doing, breaking the bread, what the Roman Catholic Church calls communion in the Mass, um, that is actually something that is ordained by Jesus Christ. And he never said that you should only do that only once a year. He said, whenever you break this bread, do this in remembrance of me. Whenever. So you can even do that daily. And I think this is quite a nice quote-unquote tradition. I, wanna, I don't want to call it tradition, but a way of him uh, to recall every time when he breaks the bread, he breaks the loaves and distributes it all, sit down, whether they are Puritans or the believers, and uh, gives the sentence in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always to break this bread. So, of the Valdenses, Americus thus writes on page 3, number 112, 
quote, those among them that are perfect, but in the upper part of the shoe or sabata are, uh, are sort of a escuthion as a sign from which they are called in Zabatati. They have one among them, superior to the rest, whom they call Majoralis, or Elder, to whom alone, and to no other, they yield obedience. Well, I only yield obedience to Jesus Christ. When they sit at the tables, they bless in this manner, quote, He who blessed the five barley loaves and two fishes in the, uh, in, the uh, in the desert to his disciples, bless this table to us. Unquote. And when they rise, they repeat those words of the revelation, blessing and honor and wisdom and thanks and glory and strength be unto our God for ever and ever. Amen. Always holding their eyes and hands lift up to heaven. This account is agreeable to what we read to what we read of the Valdenses in the book of sentences of the uh, Toulouse Inquisition, but much more explicit and distinct. So in other words, we have just learned about how the Valdenses and the Albigenses kept the word of God of breaking the bread, and how they did that, and with what kind of ritual they did it. And one thing is most important hereby to understand is that However, the Albigenses and the Valdenses here broke the bread. The difference with the Roman Catholic Church is that in the Roman Catholic Church, the priest upholds the bread, the wafer, and says five words of hocus pocus, hoc est corpus enum meum, and by that he commands Jesus Christ out of heaven into that bread and he says he, the priest the Pope, the Roman Catholic Church it is canon law that by saying these words, hoc est corpus enum meum Jesus Christ is called out of heaven into that little bread and this little bread becomes the body and blood and soul and flesh and divinity and humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ and then it is sacrificed over and over and over and over again that's the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church and the account that we've just read about breaking the bread as it, called, as it was called in the book here of the Valdenses and the Albigenses is much more according to the command of Jesus Christ much more according to the Bible, if you ask me. Now, let's continue, and uh, we are also coming to the end of the reading of today with the last two paragraphs here. The same Americus, number 88, etc., charges these heretics of this time with many equivocations and tricks by which they endeavor to deceive the inquisitors when they interrogate them concerning their faith, meaning, if they are asked, do you believe the sacrament of baptism necessary to salvation, they answer, I believe, by which they mean their own private faith and not their believing the doctrine they are asked about. Or, if it pleases God, I believe well, meaning that if it is not pleasing God, that they should believe that as the inquisitors would have them. Or, by returning the question, Sir, how do you believe? And when the Inquisitor answers, I believe the faith of the Church of Rome, they reply, I believe so, meaning that they believe the, inquisitors, the Inquisitor believes as he says, not that they believe as he does. These and other like things he affirms that he observed during the administration of his office. Now, I still have to make a little comment about what I just read here. Mm -hmm. uh, it says... Oh, where, where is this here? Come on. Uh, the heretics of this time with many equivocations and tricks. 
<laughs> Equivocations and tricks. Yeah, of course, you, you maybe have to use that when, uh, <laughs> when the Inquisition asks you some questions. Um, this little example, if they are asked, do you believe the sacrament of battle is necessary to salvation? They answer, I believe by which they mean their own private faith and not their believing of the doctrine they are asked about. Or, if it, God, uh, if it pleases God, I believe well, meaning that if it is not pleasing to God, that they should believe as the inquisitors would have them. Or, by returning the question, Sir, how do you believe? And then the inquisitor answers, I believe the faith of the Church of Rome. They reply, I believe so, meaning, listen, that they believe the inquisitor believes as he says. Not that they believe as he doth. <laughs> these equivocations, these mental reservations, is something I, yesterday evening I was with Brett uh, on the phone uh, on the Sabbath evening, and uh, we were reading in the Catholic Encyclopedia of 19, uh, 1911 um, the uh, mental reservation article about one page. And uh, that was so funny at times. And here comes the same back. Equivocation and mental reservation. Yeah, you are asked a question. Okay, the Bible says do not lie. So, how can you twist your answer in a way that you do not lie, <laughs> but that the other one is satisfied with the answer he gets? Well, that's mental reservation and equivocation, as we have in this case here. So they are not lying, they are answering the question correctly, but it is the things that they leave out that they actually want to say, if you understand what I mean. So anyway, let's come here to the last paragraph of today's reading. I have been the longer on this account of the Albigenses and Waldenses that everyone may judge whether they were one or two different sects, as I said. I think they were kind of intermingling even. To speak my own mind freely, they appear to me to have been two distinct ones, and that they were entirely ignorant of many tenets that are now ascribed to them. Particularly the Waldenses seem to have been plain men of mean capacities, unskillful and unexperienced, and if their opinions and customs were to be examined without prejudice, it would appear that amongst all the modern sects of Christians, they bear the greatest resemblance to that of the Memonites. And this continues our reading for today in the history of the Inquisition. And we are going to continue next time in chapter 9, as you can see here, of the persecutions against the Albigenses and Waldenses. So we were now explaining what the Albigenses and Waldenses are all about, yeah? the definition of the Albigenses and Waldenses, as we started on page 45 in this book, and we have now arrived at page 58, 13 pages longer, and that's the reason why I read this PDF and not the other one. And next time we will continue here on page 58 in the book, or page 226 of 746 in the PDF, in reading number, what is that, probably number 32, eh? because this was number 31, yeah, number 32, and we will continue here next time. So again, I want to apologize for if here and there my reading was not that much understandable, but I hope that you can uh, understand and forgive me, and that by reading along with it, you will get at least the same understanding out of the book reading that I get here. But this definitions that we read on the Albigenses and the Valdenses, I think we can see that maybe there were two distinct quote-unquote sects from the Roman Catholic Church, of course. Um, but one thing they had in common, and that is that they upheld the Word of God and um, that they lived biblically. They kept the Sabbath and all the other nine commandments, and that is already a very big difference with the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. And whether here or there they had some wrong teachings in them. I mean, who doesn't? I mean, otherwise we would all be Christ's. But we, are all, we will only be like Christ when we are in heaven, not here on this earth, because that's not possible. We cannot keep the law. We cannot, we cannot be perfect. We can strive to be perfect. We can strive to be righteous. And we can get 
righteousness imputed from Jesus Christ on us when we confess our sins to him, but we can never be perfect. We can strive to be righteous, but the Bible says there is not one righteous, no, not one. That also includes saved and born-again Christians. We have to live with our shortcomings in this world. So did the Albigenses and the Waldenses. But even though they had shortcomings, they went out into the world and they evangelized and eventually fell on the hand of the Inquisitors, what we are reading about also in the next chapter of the book, History of the Inquisition by Philip from Limborg, from the beginning of the 17th century. So I thank you very much for watching and listening and commenting, and until next time, God bless you. Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, it says bye bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.